Hello everybody who's joining us. We shall be starting in a moment. Um, just We're just letting people in. So we shall wait until one o'clock before we officially start. But in the meantime, thank you all for joining. I think the admin is busy letting everybody in. Um, so if you don't mind just waiting a little bit, I think we are now on one o'clock. So I think we should start. So I shall hand over to Audrey West. She will introduce herself and then we shall start the programme. So welcome to Yum Yum. Over to you, Audrey. Oh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome for join, to joining us for lunch. Um, we're likely to have some diaspora dishes. Sorry we can't share them directly with you, but I hope you'll be inspired to go and make some of these plates. Now, you might wonder how we've come to be doing Yum Yum. Um, it's part of a Being Human festival that's been um, led by the University of London School of... Um, let's see, where are we? National Festival of Humanities, run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. And they've been running now mostly um, for about 13 years now. And this year, um, we'd hoped to do more interactive things, but we got interrupted by COVID. So most of the events are online. Um, now, the um, you, the events are free, which is great, but we do, it does need funding. So if any of you want to contribute towards either our organisation or um, the Being Human Festival event, that would be brilliant because um, it's really lovely that we can actually share this event across um, as wide as possible. So thankfully, we do have online um, agencies. This event will be recorded and live streaming, re streamed. So please recognize that. And so if you want to, us to see your face, keep it there. It's very nice to see who's here. If you don't want to be recorded visibly, then please um, un take your video bit away. Um, now, uh, Marion, it will be our chair and she will guide us nicely through the afternoon. Um, I'm working as Arts Development Officer for Race Council Cymru which um, is a networking organization across uh, Wales for black and minority ethnic communities. Marion will explain in more detail what, what that organization does. Um, and we've also, we're working with partners alongside being human with Bangor University, Neodogwen, Penryn Castle, Pontia Arts, and the North Wales um, Colonial Diaspora representatives here, as well as a representative all the way from Sri Lanka, who will be introduced to you shortly. Um, so um, this weekend, we've presented a race of um, activities. Um, the first one was in Penryn Castle, um, a natural national trust heritage site um, that is open now about it, how it got its wealth, which was from slavery and the slate industry, both of them highly um, exploitative industries, for want of a better word. Um, and the children had a chance to rename some of those colonial objects and find their own language to, to describe that history. Um, and on Friday evening, we also talked about our languages, disputed and contested languages. And we had a nice time. Sorry some of you couldn't join in that discussion, but it's still available online and will be online. And today, as you can see, we're doing some Zoom journeys um, around colonial heritage diaspora, both in the UK and abroad. Um, and the icing on the cake, so I hope you can stay and come along later, is an ev evenings event called Speak Up. So find that again online. And that's a celebration of Black, African, Asian and other minority language diversity in song, spoken word, and other interesting forms, including imagery. So that will be at 5.30 this evening, this afternoon. Um, so Marion will introduce you now to other people on the panel. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, Audrey. Well, my name is Marion Gwynne, Dr. Marion Gwynne. I'm the Head of Heritage for Race Council Cymru. It's an organisation I'm absolutely passionate about. And I'm delighted to say that um, Race Council Cymru is hosting today's event and we have several representatives of Race Council Cymru with us today. It's an umbrella organisation for well over a hundred different BAME organisations across 
Wales and we work very closely not only with grassroots organisations but also with um, statutory bodies like for example the Welsh Government and many other um, large organisations. Um, we do, we run a number of projects, initiatives um, across the whole of Wales and partner with a broad range of um, organisations and, and groups. Now, one thing we try to do is by acting as an umbrella organisation is to bring people together. And I can't think of a better way of doing it than through the Being Human Festival, because that is what it's all about. It's as us as people. One of the best ways to bring people together is through food. No matter what event we hold, we always try to make sure that there is food available. Um, it just knocks down all barriers. You can talk about it, you can smell it, you can taste it. It generates memories. Food is far more than something that sustains the body. It sustains the soul as, as well. It's culturally important. It's the way that we express ourselves culturally. It's how we meet friends and family. Um, and wherever people go, they take their food with them. As a child, my childhood memories are just full of the smells of, of my, my, my mother's cooking, my, my auntie's cooking, my, my family's cooking, and the taste. And not only that, the locations of where that food was cooked and where I ate it. Now, for me growing up in rural Wales, trying to, uh, I suppose, trying to taste anything that was foreign, as it was called then, or anything from, from the British, um, former British Empire, the Commonwealth, was almost Im impossible. There was in the nearest town, several miles away, a Chinese restaurant, but that was something that we would never have gone to as a family, and I was quite old. I mean, as in a teenager before I tasted Chinese food. But then I was very lucky to meet up with some friends from around the world who let me taste their food. And it just blew my mind to be able to taste Indian food cooked by Indians. And even though I love the food, Indian food from Chinese restaurants, it, uh, from Indian restaurants, it's nothing like the food that's cooked by Indians themselves in their own homes cooked by African food cooked by Africans, Nigerian food cooked by Nigerians. It makes a difference. It really makes a difference. Now, I'm very curious about how we in Wales manage our food, the importance of it, how, how we share our Welsh heritage through our food. And I'm, I'm very curious as well about the food that people bring with them when they move to Wales. And so that's really what today is all about. So I'd like to now hand back over to um, Audrey, sorry, just before I do that, could I please ask those, unless we're speaking, to mute themselves, please. There will be opportunities for questions later. And also, if you have a question, please pop it in the chat box and we'll be able to um, deal with those as we go through um, this session. So now over to Audrey to introduce a very special guest today. Thank you, Audrey. Hello everyone. So when um, I conceptualised the idea of yum yum, um, I knew we wanted to talk about food and it sounds like a very uh, English word, doesn't it? A lot of us say yum yum all the time. And when I checked in a dictionary, we discovered it was an Indonesian word um, and that's used to describe a food that tastes really good. So um, we, I wonder where that came from into the UK language uh, because it's embedded into our language. A part of this festival actually is to look at how the words and the foods have changed and the things that we take for granted as part of our culture have travelled and have reached us through the colonial diaspora and some of those have been very hard journeys. Most of them were hard journeys for people who were enslaved from Africa. And somehow a lot of us made some good out of those journeys, despite the hardships. Um, so um, we still journey, interestingly. And I want to introduce you to Charlotte Wilson, who is my niece. So she will call me auntie. Um, and Charlotte will say where she's living and what she's doing there and why she's here. Um, 
But I will say that one of the reasons I invited Charlotte was that she had already done and already explored her food heritage in Sri Lanka and she'd already uploaded it on site. So she was ahead of the game. So I thought, come on, Charlotte, you can join this game. So join in and share that lovely food story. Please do that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Auntie Audrey. Um, and hello, everyone. And it's so lovely to be on this panel with you and also for the other people watching. It's just a pleasure to be able to speak to you. Um, I'm on the beach at the moment in Sri Lanka in Mount Lavinia. I thought it was nice to come to the beach. It is night time here now, so it's a bit dark, but hopefully you can all still see me and um, enjoy what I've, what I've got to say. Um, I actually came and had my food here and I'm um, on the beach. And um, yeah, so I thought, oh, that was quite a good setting for, for this. Um, yeah, so as Auntie Audrey was saying, um, I actually, um, I've been, well, I've been in Sri Lanka for about eight years now, and I've been back in the UK, born and brought up in the UK, um, with Jamaican heritage, which is really important to me. Um, and so I've been in Sri Lanka for eight years now, but um, have been back to the UK and then came back to Sri Lanka. It's kind of one of those places that you think you're going to leave and not come back to and you always end up coming back. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's kind of like magical. Um, at one point it was called serendipity by someone English, I think, a colonial person. <laughs> I need to check the, um, the details of who. Um, but yeah, um, and I suppose for me, it was just like when I first came to Sri Lanka, um, so I came from so okay I came from England um, working in England and growing up in England went to Maldives and went to live in Maldives and was working in the Maldives and then moved to Sri Lanka and I always say that the journey from um, from from Maldives to Sri Lanka was more difficult than the journey from London to Maldives uh, because it, culturally it's just so massively different um, first of all um, and it was just it was just like a massive culture shock for me in a, in a lot of ways um, sort of being away from my family and you know it's like my extended family as well my parents came and visited me I'm really lucky and I've got my son who he left with me left London with me at the age of five he's now 15 so he's been out of the UK for years and years and years um, but it was just like the most massive culture shock and I suppose for, for me Sri Lanka was so important in in the way that Jamaica was important because when we were younger my parents I'm so lucky that I've got parents that took us back to Jamaica and that was really important um, for them like to do that um, and so um, we always went on road trips in Jamaica and that was like a massive massive part of of what of my memory growing up and being in the back of like vans and like you know not without my parents with my parents but like even granddad picking us up from the airport auntie Audrey and like picking us up in a van and putting all the all the luggage in the back and you know it's just like that and I, we've kind of I kind of replicated that in a lot of ways in Sri Lanka and um I suppose for me the the time that I saw so um the time that I saw saltfish in Sri Lanka for the first time and saltfish for those that don't know ackee and saltfish is the national dish of Jamaica so um, I saw saltfish for the first time at the side of the road hanging up on a road trip in Sri Lanka and I remember when I saw it and I was like what this is so crazy I don't understand what the connection is I don't understand it and I was I was you know with my family with my then husband at the time and going through Sri Lanka and then I'd come across these kind of things that just reminded me of, of being Jamaican but like you know kind of Jamaican which is so important to me but a Jamaican born and brought up in England where everyone you know that you're English you know it's you're British but everyone still asks you when you're growing up where are you from and all the things oh you don't speak like a Jamaican or like you're not intelligent like like there's so many just preconceived notions of what it means to be Jamaican and all the rest of it which that's kind of like another story <laughs> but I'm going off on a tangent but I just think that the road trip 
thing for me over here has been so important because it's been exploring the country and it's also like memories of childhood for me and then I was able to then share that with my son Dylan um, but in a different country which has been amazing and um, we haven't done a road trip for a while but we did a lot when he was little um, and so that was the first kind of time that I was like uh, there's some sort of cultural link here what is it I'm not sure what it is but I need to do something about it. And it was years that I'd kind of like seen the different links in Sri Lanka and Jamaica and like, you know, and then obviously with my Britishness as well, that it kind of just got mixed into everything. And um, I wasn't well for, for, for a while. I left Sri Lanka for a bit, but I still had my family here in Sri Lanka and then came back. And when I came back, I was like on a mission to express myself, basically express my ideas and to make them, um, make them, manifested basically and so um, I had lots of different ideas about the food related to Sri Lanka and how it linked with Jamaica and I wanted to put it on film and so I spoke to um, so I found a, a producer and a director and I'd never done anything much to do with film before although I was a drama and English teacher so and done a bit of acting and stuff before but not anything like any um, presenting I suppose um, but I had my ideas and so my first programme of Charlotte's World, which is linked with food, was Aki and Saltfish, but the Sri Lankan version. And so I went out um, in my tuk-tuk um, and bought uh, saltfish from the side of the road. Um, and um, Ashani is one of um, one of my, I became friends with her basically and talked to her. She, she owns the saltfish stall that I bought this saltfish from that you'll see in the video. And, um, you know, I, I, at one point before even doing this film, I went and spoke to her and told her, but we have this in Jamaica and they have it with Aki. And then I showed her a picture of Aki and she was like, whoa. So basically there's a link in Sri Lanka for those that don't know with the Portuguese and the Portuguese came here um, and if you like go along the coast of Sri Lanka especially like places like Negumbo there's Portuguese influences you know there's Portuguese influences in like Gaul and other places as well and so they'll have forts which were basically like in built by Portuguese. So Sri Lanka has had lots of um, kind of people coming in and invading in different forms. Um, the Portuguese were one that did that. Um, and something that I was talking about um, recently with Aunt Yorchi was the fact that the Portuguese uh, slaves, so the black slaves, um, from Portugal actually brought Baila to Sri Lanka, which is like the most random thing, but it's amazing because now Baila is a massive part of the Sri Lankan music um, culture. Um, so I think in the 70s, uh, a Sinhalese person translated a lot of the Baila songs um, that were originally sung by the Portuguese Kafirs, they're called here. Um, they're, so there's still a community of black descendants that were brought in from the port by the Portuguese. So there's a massive like links with the cultures. Um, and also when you come over here, like say like you go into tuk-tuks and stuff, you'll see like Bob Marley tuk-tuks. <laughs> like, I used to get really excited when I saw a Bob Marley tuk-tuk because it made me feel really like safe and like I was somehow at home connected even though I'm not, I'm not, um, I didn't even grow up in Jamaica, but you know, it's like that whole thing. And so, yeah, and so I suppose with the with the Aki and Saltfish, I just wanted to show that, like, sometimes I guess someone like me just kind of randomly turning up in Sri Lanka and having this this multi uh, multi heritage because obviously I was born in England, so that is a massive part of the way I see life, um, and you know that's not to be denied at all and. But that's sort of also fed into how I've done done my food programs as well, because like, you know, it, it's got massive influence. And so, yeah, so I so my first video that um, is connected to 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 what we put in here is um, the Aki and Saltfish. So I talk there about how Aki was brought in from West Africa. Um, and you've got like the connection with uh, William Blythe Mutiny on the Bounty. He actually brought 
some Aki from Jamaica to Kew Gardens and they named, uh, they gave the name of Blightia Sapida um, to Aki as the um, official name, the scientific name, naming it after William Blight. So that's kind of interesting in itself. Um, and then obviously the salt fish. So salt fish, something that's easy to, to store and to transport over the sea. And so we've got like this, this history with the food, um, which is so linked to slavery. Um, and I don't, uh, by the way, I don't call people slaves. I call them the enslaved people um, because I don't believe that they are slaves. They were enslaved, it's a verb. Um, so it was done to them, uh, just to let you know. Um, that's like my kind of political kind of um, feelings. But um, I guess they're not really political, it's just actual. But you know, it's kind of like this link, this link that we have, which we kind of have this idea of culture being really, um, you know, separate and really like, um, sort of standard standardized and it's just not because when you look through history um it's just something that has been sort of like mixed up and and uh, you know there's such an amalgamation of different cultures in different countries over the uh, across the world and then because of that you've got the interlinkedness of like you know um uh, of of what we're experienced what i've experienced um myself like firsthand so yeah, hope that makes sense. Hope everyone's resonating with that and interested in what I'm saying. I also thought it'd be, it'd be nice to show you some um, Sri Lankan alcohol, <laughs> which is a uh, toddy. It's a toddy that's made from coconuts and it's called Arak. And this is actually gaining popularity um, now. I think they're starting to export it. I'm by the railway, so that's what you're hearing now. They're starting to export it now um, and it's becoming like a drink where it's kind of like a bit classy but over here the people that generally drink Arak is like again it's one of those things that you find with like you, slave food and you know this kind of exportation of that and then it becomes gentrified the same kind of things happened with Arak so that's quite interesting in itself as well so it, it's a coconut toddy and um, one of my um, one of my next uh, videos will be actually doing Arak ice cream so I've taken a lot of the ideas from like um, um, Jamaican food. So in Jamaica, we have rum and raisin ice cream. So the rum for me and Arak is really similar. Like there's so many similarities um, with it, like in terms of the, you know, just it's like a hard liquor. They call it over here hard liquor. So yeah, so that's um, that's a bit of a bit of background to uh, to me and to what I've done. So I hope you enjoy um, my video. It's uh, it's. Yeah, it's um, Aki and Saltfish, um, but with a Sri Lankan twist. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Really looking forward to watching your video now. Thanks so much for such an interesting background. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name's Charlotte, and welcome to my world. Um, so today we're actually going to be making Aki and saltfish and we're in Sri Lanka. You might wonder why we're doing that here. It's the Jamaican national dish after all. But the thing is, my parents are both from Jamaica and so my DNA is from Jamaica. Even though, yes, you can hear it, I've got a London accent and I'm in Sri Lanka. So it's just a big mix of different countries and that's what we're looking at today. Now you're going to come with me and we're going to go and get the ingredients for the ackee and salt fish and we're going to start off with the number one ingredient, the fish. Come on, let's go. Today we're off to Ashani's dried fish stall in Talawatagoda, which is right near to where I live. The 
very first time I met Ashani, I started talking to her about ackee and saltfish. I got out my phone and showed her pictures of the dish, so it's really exciting to be cooking this with the fish from her stall today. Guess what guys, my mum's decided to join me. That's so cool. So you can see here there's like a wide range of dried fish. Um, normally for something like ackee and salt fish, we'd go for this type of fish which is very meaty. But I'm actually going to experiment and try this fish. So I'm going to be soaking it overnight and see what's happened. Hi Shani, I'd like to get one of these please. Yeah. What's, what's this called in Sinhala? Uh, this is Vanna Katta. Vanna Katta, okay. Okay, so I'm going to get one of these. I'm going to try and cook it with this one. Okay. All right, so now we've got the fish. Let's get home and get cooking. I'm really looking forward to starting this ackee and salt fish. One minute. Where's my mum? Whoops, oh no, I forgot her. Come on, mum. I have to have one king coconut a day and um, you know what they say a tambali a day keeps the doctor away every day i come here for my sweet corn it's so fresh it's beautiful it's amazing Now we've got all our ingredients together um, and I'll go through them one by one. You can see it's looking really colourful and just really, really lovely. Aki and salt fish is the national dish of Jamaica, right? So we've got our salt fish from our stall and it's been soaking overnight and now you can see it's actually quite tender and we will be boiling that but it's ready to go. We've got our aki here. So our second really important ingredient. Um, so this is actually actually comes in a tin uh, and it's been drained. Um, the really important thing about ackee is that you have to make sure that it's well boiled. But we'll come to all that later as well. So we've got our other key ingredients here. So we've got our scallion, otherwise known as spring onions, many different names. We've got our thyme, we've got our garlic, we have got our onions and we have got some peppers. Now, normally, if you're in Jamaica, you'd make ackee and salt fish with scotch bonnet peppers, but I'm using different type of peppers here because I couldn't find them in Sri Lanka. We're also going to be adding in some cherry tomatoes. And last but by no means least, we've got our island pearl coconut oil, which is what we're going to be cooking it up with and our curry powder. So the fish has been soaking overnight and now we're going to boil it. So we're only gonna boil it for about half an hour because it's really quite soft already. And in the meantime, while we wait for it to boil, we're gonna be cutting up our vegetables. So let's go for it. Come on. Yes. And now the fish is boiling and we're gonna prepare our veggies. So we're gonna start with cutting up some onions. So get on with that. So you're just doing it really quite roughly. It doesn't have to be precise or anything. So next we've got the spring onion. Mum, in Jamaica they say scallion, don't they? Scallion. Scallion, okay. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna um, cut up the scallion now. Uh, and did you know, fun fact, William Blythe, mutiny on the bounty fame, was the person who bought ackees to Jamaica, bought them from Ghana. The word aki actually originates from Twi, which is a Ghanaian language. So yeah, so aki and saltfish, we've got the African influence from the aki and the European influence from the saltfish. Okay, so next we're going to chop up our garlic. So let's go. I put garlic in everything. Love a bit of garlic. Okay, and last but not least, we've got our tomatoes. So I'm using cherry tomatoes. I'm just using a few of them, not too many. I'm gonna just chop these up now. 
I forgot to buy my Arak today. <laughs> Next time. So another ingredient that we're going to put in are some bell peppers. Um, now we've got the red, green and gold, so we've got the rasta colours representing here. Um, now some people don't like them, like my mum, but we're going to put them in today because I do. Okay, so you can see the fish is completely boiled up now and it's got a beautiful colour. Uh, so now what we're going to do is take the skin off and remove the flesh, okay? So we've got our fish all flaked up and ready to go. We've got our raki, we've got all our vegetables cut up. Okay, so we're going to put some oil into the clay pot now. Okay, so now our oil's nice and hot, so now we're going to stick in all our vegetables. Onions, garlic, tomatoes, scallion, so we've got that all in there. Okay, so now we've got our island pearl black pepper, organic black pepper, so we're just going to stick that in there. That's enough. Get a bit of a whip around again. Just put a little bit more of our oil in there. I'm going to stick in a few bits of thyme. What do you call them? Branches. Okay, we'll then put our salt fish in. It's looking really delicious. <laughs> it's looking great. I'm actually really impressed with how this looks. It's lovely. Okay, so I'm gonna put the ackee in now and just be mindful that when you're putting the ackee in, don't stir it too much because uh, then it can get squashed up. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that it's really important to boil the ackee if you're using fresh ackees, but when you get it in the tin, it's pre-cooked, so you don't need to worry about it at all. You can just mix it in with the rest of your ingredients. Okay, we're gonna put some of our island pearl curry powder in there now. There we go. Just put a little bit of that in there. One of the chilies in. Okay, so now I'm just going to put my peppers in. Okay, so that's about it for now. So we're just going to let it sit on the fire. I'm going to put the lid on. I'm just going to leave it for a little bit. Okay, so as you can see, we've got our ackee and salt fish and it tastes as great as it looks. It's really, really delicious. We've got all the colours in there. We've got our peppers. We've got our lovely meaty chunks of fish. And we've got our good wholesome pieces of ackee in there. In Jamaica, we normally serve ackee and saltfish for breakfast, but you can actually eat it at any time of the day. We're serving our ackee and saltfish today with fried dumplings and plantain. And it's just been really brilliant that we've been able to go and actually get Sri Lankan ingredients and make this Jamaican dish. I hope that you are able to experience this dish yourself and make it at home. Okay guys, see you on the next adventure. Thanks for joining me. Mm, tastes so good.
Thank you, Charlotte. That was amazing. I remember when I was visiting Jamaica, being able to taste ackee and saltfish and also just stopping along the side of the road and having somebody just chop off the top of a coconut and drinking the coconut water straight from the coconut. Oh, you brought back so many memories. That was amazing. Right now, you will be joining us. Can I just say that thank you so much for saying that and I, I'm really glad that you enjoyed it and as everyone was watching the video, as I'm on the beach, the Malu man and Malu is fish in Sri Lankan, he came past. So I wanted to show you what, can you show them please? So he's here, he's waiting for you, for the video to end and then this is how um, uh, people hold the fish here, not the salt fish but um, fresh fish. So people hold it like this. Can you see that? Yes, yes we can. Yeah, so the, it, I mean, it's such perfect timing. That's um, brilliant. He's on the beach like this, holding the, holding the fish, you know, um, and so it's balanced on his shoulders. Very heavy thing balanced on his shoulders as a Malu man. Let's see if I can get another angle. <laughs> you see it? Uh, yes, we can see it. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Charlotte, that was brilliant. We will be... Say hello, bring... say hello. <laughs> Dilanka. Dilanka says hello. <laughs> Thank you. Charlotte, that was amazing. Now, we hope that you'll be able to join us in conversation because we're going to be having a, a question and answer session later. That was fantastic. Thank you for introducing your fish man to us. Thank now you. I'd like to introduce you to Audrey. Audrey's already spoken this morning. Um, Audrey is a Jamaican and she's going to be telling us a lot more about her cultural food. Now, thank you so much, Audrey. Over to you. Okay, well, it's lovely to see Charlotte. And as we established earlier, um, it, there's a bit of nepotism going on, but you can see why, can't you? Um, because um, literally, it's really interesting about Charlotte and her close identity to, to Jamaica. Um, a lot of us from Jamaica, people might think we're from Africa. But as Charlotte says, we're really a diverse nation. We consider um, one of the Jamaican strap line um, when it was early, in early days and when it was doing tourism, it was we're more than a beach, we're a country. And a lot of people say Jamaicans punch above their weight, but we, we do because we believe we're a country and we're, um, you know, we're very chauvinistic about Jamaica. None of us are ashamed to say that. Um, we, you know, and we've come from a past that is complex. It's built on slavery, enslavement of, um, and on oppression. And um, we have used this way of moving forward. We've moved, you know, it's still not perfect in many ways. It's a beautiful island. And, you know, all Jamaicans will say it's the most beautiful place in the world. And some of us still, be, and, you know, I really feel it in my heart. It's the most beautiful place in the world. Um, and it's quite interesting, that mixture of beauty and pain. And I'm going to introduce a dish to, um, similar to Charlotte's, but not quite the same. Um, and it will have ackies in it. And I still think of it as my Jamaican national dish. And what Charlotte explained about ackies was, um, it was brought, well, we think it was brought to Jamaica by the enslaved people. Um, when they came to Jamaica, it was a poison. Um, it, and they probably brought it and my fantasy is did they bring it to poison themselves or did they bring it to poison somebody else because in Ghana it was fed um, if it was used at all it was fed to the pigs it was never human food um, and we know that aki was I mean that salt fish was also used on the journeys of sailors that was the only way that they could um, have meat and protein it was dried fish that was on the on journeys and for a treat probably occasionally they might give the slaves enslaved people some fish now my fantasy yesterday was then thinking you know if you just get dried fish and you've got to find a way to make it palatable what could you do if you had no butter you had no um seasonings and and so on now what I know of Jamaica, and a lot of you will know, for instance, about Hans Sloan, or you might not know, Sloan Square, very posh, 
Um, but the poshest place for me in Sloan Square is Chelsea Physic. And that's where Hans Sloan um, sort of set up a lot of um, knowledge about medicine. And if you do your research, you'll find that a lot of that med knowledge from, about medicine started off in Jamaica. He was a doctor in Jamaica and he got a lot of information from the enslaved people who are very skilled med medicine people. And my fantasy is that these people would have found a way to make, to change Aki from being toxic to being edible. Now it's toxic if the fruit on the tree is not opened. Yes, yeah, so it's a fruit that it fruits on the tree and when it's edible, it's opened. If you eat it and if you push it open yourself, you will die practically instantly. So there's, so, you know, don't mess with Aki. It's not one to be played with. Um, and that's why we get it in tins. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, where are we? So I've emptied my tin of Aki and um, I've cooked with it. But my other ingredient, and I've emptied it already, is um, jackfruit. So I am being most un, um, what's it, traditional because um, I, don't, I don't really like salt fish and my daughter is also allergic to fish. So, and um, I prefer to be vegetarian and vegan most of the times. So I've introduced another way of cooking ackies and salt fish, which is ackie and no fish. So let's see how the vegans um, can do this. Um, so I will ask, um, uh, let's see, Kasha, whether she can start sharing my screen and I'll go through it. Let's see how we can do it. This is all new for some of us. Um, we're not used to doing come dine with me on screen like this. So let's go ahead, yes. So shall we go to the next screen, please, Kasha? Thank you. So yesterday I actually bunched up my ingredients in a traditional basket, um, but, um, and I put them in with their tins and so on, but I thought you couldn't really see very well what they were doing because we, I like a bit of tradition. Um, so um, sorry to advertise Suma, but we've got our, um, a bit like Charlotte's um, display, we've got garlic, we've got onions, we've got thyme, I've got um, red, hot red peppers at the back. Um, I've got a green pepper. I didn't include my yellow pepper, but I also used one because I wasn't sure whether I would or not. And then we've got our, our green jackfruit in water, in salted water. And we've got ackies in a tin. And that's the only way you get ackies. And that's probably the best way to get ackies because if you're going to mess with aki, you could die. So only get it from a place where you know it's actually been well looked after even if you're in the Caribbean you've got to be sure that whoever's selling you the ackies they know what they're doing um, and so and then I use um, olive oil to fry and I've got a plant in there which is part of my dish and then I've got I couldn't get any um, um, scallion so being in Wales I use a Welsh leek and I chop it up finely you've got to improvise and for my greens I've got um, kale so we like our greens. Normally we'd have um, Kalaloo in Jamaica, but it's all greens is how I look at it. And then in this high, little pot hiding there are some olives. And what's that got to do with ackies and saltfish, you might say, but let's go, go to the next screen and see where we're going with that. So um, these are the ingredients, as I explained before. Um, I'm not used to actually using jackfruit. Normally I keep um, the, I do ackies and olives and the family like it, yeah? But I thought I wanted to try something a bit different today. And I thought, should I do hackies with halloumi? And I thought, no, let's keep it vegan. So I've got my jackfruit and I've tasted them, but they were not in brine, which was, well, not very much. So I put, added a bit of sea salt and it's incredible how there's a texture which is similar to saltfish, and you will see. So these are the ackies that I've drained from a tin, as you, I explained earlier. This is the basil, which um, is going to give it another flavour. And we've got thyme, and I've chopped them all up. And this is my, um, I've used the tender bits of the leek for my scallion. And these are my black olives, because it's got to be black olives. Now, I don't think I've got a picture of the ackies um, when they're on a tree, because when they open up, the, the seeds, which are also poisonous, look like black olives. So that's my connection. And the other connection that I've kept going, but we'll see, is that um, 
uh, green, black and gold, which are Jamaican traditional colours. And that's what I'm keeping to today. All right, so we'll go on to the next screen. Thank you, Kasha. And so this is um, our plantain. Now, a plantain, I'm, I'm using for my dish today, Aki's plantain and um, kale. And for plantain, which again is one of the foods that came, travelled to Jamaica, um, from the um, colonial journeys, shall we say. Um, again, it's of the, um, a cousin of banana. And um, Charlotte's already told you a bit about Aki's. Let me see what we can say in my book about um, plants. I'm going to say, well, I'll show you my book later because I've got a treasure, which oh, I'll show it to you now, actually, why not? This is, can you see, traditional Jamaican cookery and it's by Norm Ben Giat, and it is like my Jamaican Bible. I do have a Jamaican Bible, but that's in Jamaican, but this one is the food one. Um, and it was published in 1985, and she tells such brilliant stories, and as well as history about Jamaican food. Um, so what she says about the banana, um, and it, the um, Plantings are a cousin, is indigenous to the old world tropics and was brought to the Sudan and Morocco by Arabs trading in ivory and slaves. The Portuguese took it to, to the Guinea coast of West Africa, 1469 to 74, and from there to the Canary Islands in 1482. And it was from the Canaries that the plant was carried to the New World. Some 27 varieties are known in Jamaica. The Gros Michel, on which the Jamaican banana industry was established, was brought to the island from Martinique by Jean-Francois Pouillat, a botanist in 1835. This variety was called Martinique by the peasants. Unfortunately, the Gros Michel was susceptible to, banana, to the Panama disease, which almost wiped out this variety. The Lacatan, resistant to disease, was now, has now replaced the Gros Michel. Um, so, we can't eat, like bananas, you can eat them raw. Plantains have to be cooked, you can't eat them raw. Um, I don't know what they will do to you, but you never eat them raw. But, so we have to wait until the, the um, skin is practically black before you that cook it. And barbecued plantains are amazing. Plantains are a favorite. Now, one of, that's one of the things I find hard to get in Wales, but um, I got this, I'll show you later the supermarket I got it from yesterday, fortunately when I happen to be in Bangor. Um, so we move on to the next, thank you. So this is the early stage of cooking the um, jackfruit, which came from a tin, as I explained earlier. There's my tin of jackfruit. Um, so I fried the ingredients that you saw, the onions um, or scallions, you might want to call them, the garlic, and I've sorted the jackfruit and it's in with the peppers and time and so on. So um, early stage of frying. Um, so let's see the next one, please. Um, and then this is at the stage where you might normally leave it, where it looks pretty much like ackee and salt fish. And actually it tasted pretty much like it without the chewy taste, but there was a texture there, which we're, when we're looking for food, it, we're looking for the, the flavors and textures. That's what I'm looking for anyway. Um, and they got to, agree with my palate. We're quite fussy, some of us. Um, and so it's actually working, I think. Um, so we, should we move on to the next one? And so this is um, further on with um, the cooked meal. As Charlotte explained earlier, you don't want to overcook the ackees. They're already actually in the tins, so they're already cooked. So literally all you need to do is just heat them um, so they don't break up because it's quite nice to see the shapes. Now back to ackees, to me the nearest other fruit I've seen that they look like um, are cashews. Um, they grow similar to the cashew plant, if you've ever, if you've ever seen a cashew plant. Um, so there's a nutty taste to them. They're not, some people think they taste like scrambled eggs, but there's a very smooth nutty taste, um, which is and mild, so quite buttery. Um, and so when I was thinking earlier, it really does go well with something like a salted fish. Obviously you soak out the salt not to get that too, too saltiness, but I included the olives because it brings back the salt and the texture. So that's my um, invention in terms of the ackees and olives. Um, and also it brings back that black um, seed, which is not poisonous in my dish. 
So shall we move on to the next one? So this is where um, I bought the, um, the, let's see, the Aki's yesterday, which was fortunate. I happened to be in Bangor. I happened to be in Bangor because I was in the, at Penryn Castle and work, doing the workshop with the young children um, around um, names and identity um, in relation to colonialism. So it was very fortunate to be there because I, where I'm in, in the town, the small town I am, I get some of the ingredients, including, including jackfruit, from the local store, from the local supermarket, which is a national one, so I won't um, advertise it. So you can actually still get quite a few things in, for instance, organic or alternative sections. Um, but it's really nice to be able to go into um, the, what I, you know, I'm a traditional Jamaican, so we would say the Indian shop. Yeah, we always say, that we, call them, we call the Indian shop, it's Asian and continental, which suits me, because I like um, fusion food. Um, but when we were young, um, all our parents, we say, go to the Indian shop, go to the Indian man, because they always had the food that we wanted. It was one of the few places in the UK where we could get the traditional foods. Um, and it's still that way. And again, this links to our colonial heritage, because the whole, as we know, the whole colonial expansion started with the spice trade and people wanting to keep their food um, for longer when they didn't have fridges and spices were one way of preserving your food. And of course, where did you get spices in Europe um, besides um, traveling all the way to the Indias? And how did they come across Jamaica? They, they lost their way. And then we got um, the West Indies, oh, it's the wrong place, but they still kept going. And um, here we are. Um, back to Sri Lanka, the little long round the world journey. And here we are back to UK and here I am back in Wales. Um, and this is actually back to what Charlotte was saying again, my, and also Marion, our explorations are human. My, um, do you know, the, you know, the, my um, passion for instance is, um, uh, let's see, I do olives. I remember when olives in the UK were new. I don't know if some of you remember in the seventies when people started eating olives and initially they were yuck. And now they're a part of our everyday diet for some people. Um, do you, I don't know if any of you remember those days. Um, is there another, do you remember? <laughs> exactly, um, you know, there was a trendy hippie period when for instance hummus was like, whoa, you know, you've got hummus and now it's in every supermarket. So, do you know, we change as well as our, our foods. And it's amazing what becomes normalized for every day. I remember when yogurt was new and Oh, we could eat that, you know, and now children have it every day for the breakfast. Um, so food travels as well as people. Is there another um, um, screen, uh, Kasha? I can't do oh, here's my dish. So this is the one I prepared earlier. Um, I did the greens this morning and the plantains. And normally you would have rice, but I didn't want to have cold rice. So we'll have that later on. But we, I would normally do white rice um, with my aki and and aki and dot 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 salt fish um aki and jackfruit and olives and dot 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 to plantains so here we are um now charlotte's i don't know if you're seeing charlotte's um image but she's saying that's how i learned to make it <laughs> so i'm still traditional whether <laughs> you agree with me or not um but i actually will again i i just love the fact that um, even though we keep these traditions and they do change, um, we can still appreciate them and our children can still appreciate them. My daughter, as I said earlier, she's allergic to fish, um, but she can still appreciate a plateful of ackies and a plateful of food that reminds us of Jamaica. And, and plantains are the one thing I will say that I miss in North Wales because they're so hard to get. And that's usually my staple when I'm in London. I've moved from North Wales to uh, from London to North Wales for three years now, and it is the when I was moving from London, my worry was where am I going to find the Indian shop, and I asked the Indian restaurant, please would you set up an Indian shop for me? And they said, no, we go to Birmingham, and I said, oh, can I come with you? <laughs> you know that is that you know that is the one connection. As well, at least I know I can get to Bangor uh, or other places to find my Indian shop. So here we are. Thank you very much. I think that's enough.
Thank you so much. And can I thank everybody who's been um, contributing on the chat line? I'll be going through some of your questions, your points, and thank you to those who've been sharing recipes. Do please have a look at those. They are some, some fantastic comments coming along there. We are um, just slightly behind time, and it's important that we... Um, is Omo here? Oh, there we go, Omo, fantastic, because Omo sadly can't stay with us until the, until the end. But I'd like now to introduce Omo. Um, she'll be able to give a little bit of more information about herself. But Omo, uh, to me, I remember when I started going to Wrexham for all the cultural, multicultural events that, um, that uh, CLPW used to hold, the uh, Race Council Cymru, all the Black History Month events, it was always Omo preparing the food. And the food was always something I used to so look forward to. The flavours, the smell, and served by Omo, who doesn't stop dancing. So whenever she was serving the food, she was always dancing. Now, Omo is going to tell us about, um, Omo's Nigerian. She's a founder member of the Wrexham African Society. And so I will let her talk about her Nigerian food. Omo, over to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omo. And like what uh, Dr. Marian has said, I've always worked alongside Yolanda. I'm just going to talk about Nigeria food. And today, just like what Audrey said, they planted. Africa and Caribbean, they always have something in common. Like I know we eat yam and they eat yam as well. But the way we eat our plantain is quite different from the way the Caribbeans eat their plantain because we can either eat our plantain raw when it's green or when it's ripe. Because when it's ripe, it's very, when it's green, it's very starchy. And they said it's good for diabetes. Mm -hmm. So most people prefer eating it when it's green and because it's healthy as well than when it's yellow. And you can actually dry it up to make powder, which you use as fufu. Mm -hmm. So you could see that we have something in common. And today I'm going to talk about the fish. We use fish in Nigeria a lot. And when I was growing up, I remember they used to say that when you cook with fish, that means you are poor. We thought eating meat makes you healthy and show that you're rich. But as time goes on, we now realize that Eating fish is very heady than eating meat. So a stew is one just like everybody kind of stew. But our stew, we use it to eat either rice, plantain, boiled yam. You can use stew to eat anything. And when I got to UK, I discovered that Using vegetable oil, like the way we used to use it in Africa, is not as healthy as using palm oil. Just past some technology said palm oil is not good, but with palm oil, palm oil helps with uh, diabetes, it helps with infertility, it helps with cancer, and it helps when you have deficiency of vitamin A. So rather than using the um, vegetable oil, I've always used palm oil to cook because it has a lot of benefit rather than the vegetable oil. The other one that you can use instead of vegetable oil is olive oil, but getting virgin olive oil is quite expensive and is difficult. So I stick to my traditional palm oil. So I, I got the recipe and I, prepared everything and I would like us now to see what I've done. If you could share this screen please. <laughs> okay, these are all the ingredients I use. We have a seasoning cube that we call non magi and we have a seasoning powder. In Africa, we hardly use salt. We use more of seasoning powder or seasoning cube. We have the fresh tomatoes and the palm oil. I had to cut it open so that you see the way the palm oil is. It's, when it's cold, it comes as a paste, so you have to scoop it. And we have our rice that you can get from any shop. 
Like what Audrey said, getting our African product is quite difficult in Wales. So most times we have to travel to Manchester or London or Birmingham to get our African products. So what I do most times, the very difficult one, I try as much as possible to buy it in bulk so that it will last me for a while. Next slide, please. So this is the rice when I was getting ready to boil the rice. And now I'll tell you about the uh, stew. The stew, you just, you prepare your palm oil, allow it to be hot a little, chop your tomatoes and your onions and saute it for a few minutes because you don't want the oil to be blend, blanched. For a few minutes, saute it, then you add your seasoning. As you're adding your seasoning, always check with taste because you don't want the seasoning to overpower the natural taste of the food. Then, but on this particular food, I decided to use salmon fish because salmon is very, very healthy. We, I use salmon fish. I just grade it. I grade it a little so that it can, it, it can, it can blend into the stew. Because I have a son with special need who is very fussy with his food. So what I do, rather than making the salmon fish to stand as a whole, I grade it a little so that it will break into the stew. The next slide, please. That is it. It's just the boiled rice and the salmon stew. It looks red because it's just tomatoes and the palm oil and some seasoning. Under 10 minutes, you're done preparing your stew. And it's very, very healthy because the vitamin, uh, the palm oil is there, the salmon fish is there, and it makes the soup like, it, it, it breaks into the stew and makes it like it flakes. That is my own traditional way of cooking in uh, Wales or UK. And moreover, because I'm from Africa, I make sure that my heritage is still felt in the home by preparing our traditional food. And my children know that, that when, because at times they used to laugh and they said, oh, mama, why are you doing it? And I was just saying that, you know what? I was born and brought up in Africa. So you still have to have the traditional taste in the house. And that is my little recipe. Thank you, everyone. Oh, oh, that was that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, you've just mentioned your children. Will they actually eat it? Yes, my children eat everything I cook. And you know what? I know when I was growing up, my mom used to make a statement is that what is what I have I will use in training you. So whenever I cook, I always tell them that I will not steal to feed you. It's what I have I will use to feed you. So definitely, they, they definitely eat the food. Now, what I find absolutely fascinating is here we have African food moving to Jamaica, moving to Sri Lanka. It's absolutely fascinating. Now, Charlotte, if you don't mind coming in to answer a question, does Charlotte? Charlotte, I think, there you go, Charlotte. Are you able to answer a question? Hang on, I think she's just unmuting. Sorry, I was just That's, walking along the beach because I, I, I saw my kids because then I met some friends. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, okay, you, what were the questions? The question I was just going to ask is because Omo was saying that her her children will eat all the African food that she prepares. Oh, yeah. What about your son? Does oh, he Dylan. eat? The, yes, the Jamaican. I mean, he's so used to like he's so used to he's so used to every type of food. He like he will eat Jamaican food definitely because that's just part of life. Mm. Like even though he was like five when we left, but it's part of our life. Like my dad, yeah. like like Auntie Audrey you knows this. It's like my dad was like the super like super cook. Like it's like a lot. And this is another thing. It's like so many people associate cooking and like the the feminine, but it's like so like in in Jamaican culture, it's so linked with masculinity as well, which like is like 
this i'm going off at a tangent this is just me like <laughs> my thoughts but it's it's just like so sort of like um actually it's really yeah that's really interesting anyway i think it's yeah but um dylan does he eat um, jamaican food yes he does and now he also eats sri lankan food yeah. um we don't eat sri lankan food all the time but there was a time where we used to eat it every single day and he got used to the spices um now when i go back to the uk personally i can't like i i have to like bring some like pepper and i just mean peppercorns like because the pepper in the uk has no taste <laughs> like, the one in sri lanka has like got proper taste <laughs> like the, cor the peppercorns themselves like you notice the difference so that's me personally but yeah dylan, dylan eats everything <laughs> yeah. thank you thank you what what about you and your daughter what what about your daughter audrey her attitude towards jamaican food african food um we've got I mean, I, when we, we like food, yeah, so, um, and we're mainly vegetarian, and we eat well, so during lockdown, for instance, every day we've had a meal, we say, oh, this is nice, this is interesting, because we're always a bit creative mm -hmm. around different cultures, including Jamaican, yeah. so, and, you know, we always think, oh, we eat too much, but we actually enjoy our food. Uh, and Yola has some allergies and we manage them. And, uh, you know, we both have allergies that we manage. Um, and so I'm conscious, again, of eating healthily. Mm, yeah. so, but um, we don't, it's really interesting when you say Jamaican, because we tend not to compartmentalise our food. Yeah. Do you know? We, I mean, because yeah. sometimes I think, oh, that was... Um, sort of Asian, you know, when you've done a stir fry and it's like Indonesian or you've done um, a Jamaican dish or, I mean, there are some, for instance, my Jamaican, traditional Jamaican cookery book, every now and then I think, oh, I'm going to try that. And there's one which is called Accra Balls, which um, is, I love it um, because it's this, um, this black eyed beans. It's very hard work, but it's, you have to chop it, um, you know, chop down the black eyed bees. Can, can I just interrupt for a moment because um, Omo has just said that... Oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Sorry, I, sorry, I, I think she has just left. Yes. Has that, left that's left okay, left. I think I'm, Omo has left. She oh. says, thank you. she did say she had to leave early, oh, so I, I was going to ask her a question, yeah. but that, that's okay. We can, uh, we'll come back to the question. Sorry, you're still muted, Audrey. Okay, I said it's easy to get carried away once you talk, start talking about food. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Topic, but thank so. you, thank you to Omo. I, I will get back to her with, with my question later. Now, we've had so far people from, I suppose, the British, um, the diaspora of the British Empire with Jamaica, with Nigeria. Um, and where we're going to now is the Portuguese empire um the portuguese diaspora spread over nine different countries and i know we're going to have a little bit of an introduction to that now um, but to introduce our session focusing on portuguese and the portuguese diaspora we have yolanda banu viegas who is another crucial member of race council Cymru, but is also head of clpw um, the Portuguese language as community in Wrexham and she will introduce herself now. Over to you Yolanda, thank you for joining us today. Oh thank you Marian, uh, good afternoon everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about one of the things I love most in this world which is food. Uh, in particular, mum's food, you know, so I was very lucky yesterday, I had my mum here with me and she shared with us uh, two recipes, one sweet and one sour from our, our home country in Mozambique. Uh, so I was born in Mozambique, but we, I left to Portugal when I was six. So I don't have much recollections about my uh, heritage. So I thank my mom uh, and it's thank, uh, uh, thanks, um, uh, about her that I know some of our traditions, mainly about the food. I remember yesterday when mom was preparing one of the dishes, she rang her sister in Portugal and said, should I add this, should I add that to the curry? 
And my auntie said, yes, you should add a, a bit of this and that. So it is a, um, a food is something that actually brings not just the family, but all of us uh, together. And uh, the smells that uh, uh, we remember, that I remember, uh, that my grandmother and my great grandmother, that they were original from India, it stays in me forever. So, um, uh, uh, so uh, as Marin was saying, we are the Portuguese Empire. Uh, um, Mozambique, it's one of the countries colonized by the Portuguese. We also have Angola, Brazil, Santo Mé, Cape Verde, Guinea Bissau and Timor, and previous of that, we also had Macau in China, Goa Mao and Dio from in India. So all of these fusions, and then it was the Portuguese who started the, the slave trade, but also trading the spices and everything else from all, all over the world. So you will find Portuguese presence all over the planet. I'm, I'm loving the stories that Charlotte shared with us. So I was even chatting with Raquel. We have to go there. At least we're going to find uh, uh, bacalhau, which is the salted cod, um, which is very much part of the Portuguese cuisine. So it, the, the, our food is just the most delicious in the planet. There's no questions about it. <laughs> we, I'm sure we all, we all say that. Uh, but it's mainly because we have these fusions of flavors from all over the world in our tradition uh, cuisine. Um, so I, I would like to share the first slide, if that's okay. So as I said yesterday, uh, I picked up my mom and we went shopping. Uh, so gladly, uh, here in Wrexham, we have now all sorts of shops from all over the world where we can get our ingredients. If they're not fresh, they are frozen, which is about the same. So in Wrexham, we have several Polish shops, Portuguese, just Portuguese to name a few. Mars Shop, Luso Food, Sea Land, Vasco da Gama, Flavors of Portugal, all of them, they sell added Portuguese uh, uh, ingredients, but also from the Portuguese diaspora. And also very lucky that we are, we have the best wine, wine in the world. So you will find Portuguese wine and beer uh, in every, every shops. We also have the Indian, several Indian shops, Chinese, Thai, international shops. So it was very easy. It is very easy now to get all the ingredients to, for us to cook, which makes us feel at home. And it, it is amazing how the smells of the food when my mom starts cooking, how that brings back memories straight away. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, to share the first, uh, the first slide. So my mom decided to do uh, uh, um, coconut curry with prawns. Uh, so as you can see, the ingredients, they're very simple just coconut milk, a can, onion, tomato, salt, piri piri, which is chili and prawn. Very simple recipe, very easy to do, and it's so delicious. Um, the, the next slide, my mom decided also to do a mandioca dessert. So mandioca for us is cassava. Uh, we can use cassava as a replace the potatoes, for example, uh, but this one is a, it's a dessert um, and it's very easy to cook and you can find cassava in every of these uh, foreign shops. So it's again very simple. You only have, uh, the ingredients is just a, co a condensed milk, coconut milk and a cassava and a bit of nutmeg just to give it a bit of flavor. Uh, cassava, uh, if I, we move to the next slide. So the preparation, oh, this is where we went shopping. It's amazing to go to these shop, shops in Wrexham. You can find uh, uh, fresh ingredients, but also frozen, salted, tinned from all over the world. So if you ever um, need any ingredients, we do have now in Wrexham, which is 
very much different when I arrived here 20 years ago when there was nothing at all. So it was so complicated for us trying to, to do a recipe that sometimes a simple cod and rice, we couldn't find the salted cod. And I tried to buy the fresh cod because it's available in the shops, but I really didn't like it. I'm not, we, we never tried the fresh cod before. And without that uh, preparation like they do, they salt it. It's exactly like the fish that uh, uh, Audrey's, Audrey's niece, Charlotte, just showed. Bacalhau needs to be salted, or oh, it's not bacalhau at all. So it didn't taste good. We didn't like it. It was, a very, it was very sad for us. We then started to get used to the British ingredients. My daughter loved baked beans. And for me, it took me a while to understand the reason for baked beans in the breakfast, but now it's fine. We adapt to all of these ingredients and flavors, and I love having the breakfast with all that bacon and sausages, but it's very different in Portugal. We're not used to it, but most of our children adapt to the British food, so we have to learn how to cook and how to do it. So you can see here, we bought chilies. I had on my fridge, raw prawns uh, and my mom said oh you bring some more prawns because it might not be enough so i look at those ones here in the right hand corner all red and with that beautiful color my mom said oh this is already cooked so that's why you will see two different uh, uh, prawns one i bought it was um not cooked and the other is cooked but we use them both anyway there's some chilies the ginger coriander, and all sorts of ingredients. Can we move to the next slide, please? So this is the preparation, very simple. Here on the left, uh, my mom, um, she uh, boiled the cassava, just one big cassava for this particular dish. It needs to, uh, to boil a bit, that is it, simple as. On the next one, as I told you, there's the cooked prawn and the raw prawn that we mixed it together. And in the middle, just the tomato and onions, just a little bit of stir, just to give it a bit of a um, flavor. On the next slide, we do have now the cooked cassava, which my mom then cut it in small pieces. Next, please. So then you, uh, on the first slide, it's the, it's a mixture of the tin of the um, uh, 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 coconut milk, yes, and a bit of condensed milk. Don't use all the tin of condensed milk because it gets too sweet. We just added the condensed milk to give, give it a bit of a sweet flavor. So that goes to boil. When it started to boil, you add the cassava and let it cool down. And then in the end, it gets this uh, pudding consistency with bits of cassava, it's delicious. That one in the middle, it was uh, me uh, um, just stirring because on, the, on that um, uh, onion and tomato, uh, my mom added a, a tin of uh, coconut milk and then she added the prawns and the chilies, a bit of salt and pepper, but um, it's not even necessary. Uh, she asked me to do some white rice but i decided to do um some uh, uh fried rice with crushed gar uh, crushed uh, garlic it does it's it gets more flavorsome so i made the rice <laughs> something i did yesterday apart from taking the pictures can we go for the next slide please so this is it the end result um this is the prawns. It gets the, all of that creamy consistency with the, with the rice. It is delicious. It's a very simple dish, but it, it brings so much memories, not just from Mozambique, because I don't remember much, but I remember my grandmother. I remember my aunties, and we all in a big table eating together. And uh, the dessert on the right-hand side, it's very good. Or as soon as you put it in the fridge, it's absolutely delicious. Very simple, nothing much to add. My mom wanted to do um, wanted to do yesterday as well some uh, um, 
peanut curry with chicken and she also wanted to do the indian uh, um uh, lamb stew but i told her mom it's a bit too much because uh, uh you know it's just a short program but you there's so much to share our uh, cuisine we then adapt uh, to the local ingredients when we have the uh, the ingredients available it makes our lives easier but when when we don't we adapt we use whatever ingredients we uh, we can uh, find and adapt to our flavors so uh, this is uh, two dishes that uh, my mom created for us yesterday and i hope you enjoy it That was absolutely delicious. Now, I've actually spent a little bit of time with the Portuguese group in Wrexham, and I've always been overwhelmed. Wherever I have gone, I have always been given food, huge <laughs> amounts of food, and it has always tasted absolutely delicious. And what they can make meals of is, is, is inspirational. Um, and keeping within the the tradition of Portugal. We're now going over to Raquel Fernandez. Um, she is, well, multi-talented. She's a science teacher. She, uh, hate crime officer, victim support officer. She's, she's so involved within her community and at the heart of everything that CLP does. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Raquel to join us today. Thank you, Marion. I'm very talented with many things, but unfortunately, I'm not a very good chef. But I'm trying today <laughs> to bring you a recipe from Portugal. So this is a recipe from Portugal and from Galicia. Uh, and uh, we also took it to Brazil in our diaspora. So now, um, people from Brazil like. And, and what I'm going to talk about is one of my favorite dishes. Uh, I'm not a good chef, but I love caldeirada. Caldeirada is a, a fish stew, and it was usually done by fishermen. So basically, uh, we need to have, a, we, the fishermen used the fish that they bring when they went fishing. So it's a we i can't tell you which fish to use so which is good because in the uk now i moved in 2015 so and i i don't live exactly in wrexham so i cannot go to the shops uh, like yolanda does uh, i had to buy fish and find fish nearby so uh could you please share on the screen so the, the, uh, the fish stew uh, that um, we do, uh, and I adapted to the UK fish. Uh, I can also mention where you can get it if you have Portuguese shop nearby. Uh, what kind of fish do we, we usually use? But for this one uh, that I used, uh, I used uh, mackerel. Uh, cod not the portuguese cod the salted cod which is used in portugal but i just found a a, fil a cod filet which is good it's uh, and i i can prove it because it was very very tasty so you can use um a, a, a cod filet you can also use the mackerel as i mentioned salmon and uh, you can use white fish some people in Portugal use uh, squid and prawn as well. So that depends on the fish that you have. So can you please pass to the next slide? So as I mentioned, the ingredients, it's the main one, it's the fish. Then we use red peppers. So we can only use red peppers, garlic, onion, tomato, you can use the peeled ones, but I bought the normal one for later. And that white wine, olive oil, and a bit of water as well. I forgot to mention. You can see if you 
if you are interested in learning a bit of Portuguese, I also write the names in Portuguese. So if you go to a shop, for instance, in Wrexham, like Yolanda mentioned, you can ask uh, the shops which is the, uh, the fish page that we use uh, to caldeirada, and they can give you pescada uh, and other kinds of fish that we don't have in common supermarkets in the UK, uh, like Lidl or Asda. So you can ask them uh, to, you can ask them to uh, help you with the fish. So can we pass on to the next slide? So now it's the preparation. So first of all, you need to peel uh, the onion, the garlic, the potatoes, and with the peppers, you need to clean the seeds and the white parts. So, and then you, ch uh, you chop the onions, put it in a big white pan, and after the onions, oh, uh, you put uh, the olive oil, and then you put the chop. Uh, can you go back, please? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you put the uh, tomatoes, uh, and then the um, red peppers. If you look at the pictures, you can see that these are all layers. The secret of the, the dish is to put everything in layers. So you put the onions in layer, then the tomatoes in, in layer, and then the red pepper in layer. After that, you put a bit of salt. There are recipes who don't mention salt, but I've used this one and this one salt. So it's up to you if you want to use or not. Um, so you can put that in layers. And after, if you want the after, we'll put the fish. Uh, can you please pass to the next slide? So we put the fish, uh, the mix of fish. Then we can add, I don't know if you like it or not, but we've used a little bit of paprika. I didn't mention all the ingredients because it's up to the person if they like it or not to put. Then you put the a little bit of cup of red wine. Again, we've used the ones that we bought in the local supermarket. But if you want to go to a Portuguese shop and ask for Portuguese uh, white wine, sorry, you can ask them to, to suggest one that it's good, the food. Then you can see how did we cut the potatoes and we put it on top of the fish with a little bit of water. The secret of caldeirada is that we can't, we can't mix. We put this with the, uh, the lid of the pan and we wait for 30, 40 minutes without mixing it, without using, we just leave that to cook. And then after 30 or 40 minutes, we can check and you can see the final result uh already in the pan cooked and then finally we can serve it can you please thank you that's that's the aspect uh, of our dinner on friday and tomorrow lunch and dinner as well because it was very 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 tasty so don't worry if you can't find the ingredients because with the ones on the local supermarkets, we can do a magnificent caldeirada and everyone will enjoy, including my children, but like you lend us children, have lost a bit of the touch with the Portuguese cuisine, but they still love vegetables and uh, potatoes. So although they don't like much fish, they had the rest. Uh, so they loved it. And they also love a little bit of soup that I cook. Uh, I didn't know if we had time for the soup, so we decided to stick with caldeirada. But next time, maybe we can do a soup, not a vegetable one, but also a fish soup. Because when I moved to the UK, one of the things that I missed most was 
fish. It was very, very difficult to have the fish that I was used to. But then I started checking and doing the dishes with the local fish and I actually got fond of the <laughs> local fish that I bought on the shops and it, it's also very good. So I hope you had enjoyed, although I'm not a, a good chef, I've tried hard <laughs> to show you a little bit of our Portuguese cuisine. Thank you so much Raquel, that is so delicious. Um, do you want to, uh, I just think what's really interesting about all our dishes so far is that there's been a strong element of fish and we can talk about that and also respond to some of the questions in the chat box. I just want to say that unfortunately um, Marion who has just chaired so brilliantly, she's been called away suddenly so um, she won't be with us for the rest of the afternoon I don't think so I'll be helping to chair us on, yeah? Um, so we just want to really give our thanks to Marion because um, she's, so, um, she's such a stalwart. And thank you very much, Marion, for being here with us. Um, and I hope you get to try out some of the recipes later on. Um, so um, we're going to now to continue to, um, first of all, talk about the, com the similarities and differences, first of all, with the Portuguese dishes. And it's really interesting about the journeys. My curiosity is whether um, we're sort of fish loving people because it's, there was a lot of journey by boat, you know, and discovery of land. So I wonder what you think. Um, do you, who should we start? I start with you, Raquel. What do you think about the love of fish? Yes, it's because we, we traveled a lot by boat. We had a, we have a big coast and we also have the rivers. So the, the rivers, we have a lot of rivers and I'll, I'm not from the, the, uh, the coast of the country. I'm from the center, but we do have a big river and people there like to fish a lot. So that's why when we cook caldeirada, we can choose all of the variety of fish because we can go to the river and fish. We had a big community there of fishermen and also traveling by boat. We got used to the eating fish and having fish for our meals rather than meat. We do have lots of uh, nice and um, tasty dishes with meat like cozido, but I've decided for this one because when I was younger, my grandmother used to cook for us a lot and I got fun. It was one of the, as a child, then I got used to fish more, but as a child, it was one of the, the fish uh, dishes that I liked to eat. It was calderada because it was very, very tasty. But yes, you're right, traveling a lot and going to discoveries and uh, uh, getting all of the um, ingredients from Africa, from India, and then we start to get our own cuisine. That I, th I find it uh, very healthy and refined with a lot of mixture of the uh, flavors. So that's why I find one of the best, I'm not saying the best because other cuisines are good, but it's one of the best and one of the healthiest, like all of the Mediterranean as well. So we are healthiest, our cuisine is very healthy. Unfortunately, children are losing uh, that, but I've tried and I, uh, I continue to give them especially soup and vegetable so they get used to that as well. I'm trying with the fish, maybe in the future they will like it better. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Yolanda because you've mentioned that your daughter um, does eat and likes the fish. I wonder, Yolanda, what does your daughter, how does she respond to the food? Oh, it's a bit complicated and it always been. Uh, with fish, it's usually okay. If it, in particular, grilled sardines, which is our speciality. Uh, if it's grilled, but if it's cooked in with different ingredients, she won't eat it. Uh, my daughter, she also has autism, so she's used to eat the specific uh, uh, dishes. So I normally cook just for her what she likes, and uh, I try to add some things, but then as she grown, 
it was difficult to tell her that that food wasn't chicken. So I had to lie when she was younger. I used to tell her everything was chicken. That's how I got her to try some of the food because uh, this has been a problem since birth. Uh, uh, since she was she was born, every time there was a, uh, some ingredients that she avoids, that she was afraid of it, uh, she would feel sick and prefer not to eat. She would prefer not to eat the entire day. Uh, uh, rather to try a bit of uh, carrots, for example. Carrots is a big no for my daughter, for example. But, um, well, she, she doesn't follow our cuisine. I'm very sad about it. I really wish she could uh, try the food that I cook and my mom cooks. And when we go to all the diverse restaurants, she would eat the only what she tolerates. Uh, so it is a bit complicated, but as as you mentioned, uh, the fish is it is also in Mozambique a big part of our culture. Just yesterday, when my mom um, was cooking the prawns, she showed me a spoon and she said, "What's this? They look bigger in the packet in Mozambique. They're this <laughs> big. It's not like that. They don't shrink as easy." But uh, yes, it's one of the differences. But we also have all sort of meat. In, uh, in particular in Portugal, we eat every bit of the pork, every bit of the chicken. We don't waste anything from any animal. Yes, uh, uh, it is part of our cuisine. We are used to eat big ears, big nose, big feet with uh, everything and uh, chicken giblets, all sort of, uh, I don't even know the name in English, but the uh, livers and the stomach and all of that, they are actually delicious delicacy that it's part of our traditional cuisine. Thank you, Logelanda. That sounds really interesting because in Jamaica, you know, chicken feet were um, a delicacy. Ooh, and, and all the, you know, all the different parts of the animal that you wouldn't <laughs> normally think of eating. Well, I would, you know. Uh, <laughs> Kicks trotters were um, a delicacy. They used to be in the UK at some point. Mm -hmm. You can't get them anywhere, can you? But oh, yes, you can. And in Portuguese good. shop, in the Polish shop, they also sell it. Oh, oh yes, yeah. my mum cooked some chicken feet in the other day. Oh, we were so happy. We felt like we were in heaven. Oh. <laughs> Those oh. <minutes. laughs> There's so much link up. What we're going to do with this next bit, actually, because we've got some um, comments from the chat box, and we're going to open up the discussion a bit so that people can. Um, we'll answer or respond to some of the comments. Um, let's see, is Charlotte here still? Um, have we got Charlotte? Uh, I think we've lost Charlotte, I can't see her. Um, so we can take comments from the chat box and then we can invite people to also speak if they want to. Um, if they want to direct any questions to us, so then they can, would... Um... Can I ask the cassava uh, question? Yes, please. Um, uh, uh, I can't read. Uh, Terlan is asking, where do you find cassava during the lockdown? It is already eight months. I did not go to the market. Before I can find cassava in a wet market in my town in Coventry, uh, we, we went to three different shops, all one after uh, uh, all the shops are close to each other by the Wrexham bus station. And all of them had cassava there. So uh, it is not difficult. Uh, it was difficult because you can't find in us or the main shop. But all of these international shops, they do, find, uh, they do sell all sorts and cassava as well. Thank you. Um, well, you're, you're fortunate. We'll have to move to Wrexham. You get everything in Wrexham by the looks of it. Yes, you just come to Wrexham. By the bus station, you find everything. You don't need to go far, further. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll do that. Um, and let's see who else we've got. Any more questions? Um, people have shared recipes, which has been really generous. So we can, we can save those. Um, let's see. Um, Gregory has been saying quite a lot. I don't know if you'd like to join in a discussion. What do you want to say to us, Gregory? He's commented quite a lot so far. Would you like to join in? No, we'll just listen to his comments because he's been um, 
Is, I think Gregory, are you in um, Ireland? I think you've not been doing oh. wonderfully. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a cook. I wouldn't even eat my, my own food, but it's been uh, really enjoyable and uh, so educational all the way all the way through. I wasn't expecting anything like a, as much from the experience. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, good to hear from you, Jeff, uh, Gregory, and thanks for all your comments in the chat box, because it really does help to keep it live and kicking. Um, thanks again. Let's see who else we've got to invite to join us. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, comment about the olive oil. That uh, <laughs> uh, it was said that olive oil is something that we used to buy in the chemist, a small tiny box to put in the, for ear aches. Actually, uh, you can use the common olive oil to put, to help with your not ear aches, but uh, it has help if it's a bit warm to take remove the wax. Uh, I find that here in this country, I, I thought that was very unusual, but actually it works. But we do use olive oil with every everything. Uh, it is much healthier. We rarely use vegetable uh, vegetable oil maybe just to fry the chips and that's it. Everything else we cook with olive oil. Thank you, Yolanda. I remember somebody on Desert Island this once said that her luxury would be olive oil to take with her because you can use it for everything. Oh, and yeah. I thought, you know, that's, a, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? And as long as you can get it um, somebody, because it's probably very hard to produce yourself, but if you can have barrels of it, that would oh, there is, all sorts. Yeah, it's very common in Portugal, not so much in, in Mozambique or in India, uh, which is more coconut oil. My mom actually said that my grandmother and my great grandmother, they used to do with coconut all sorts of beauty products that they use in the hair, in the face, in the hands and etc. So it is uh, another uh, oil that it can be used for beauty but also cuisine and it's uh, apparently very healthy. Absolutely, thank you. And so we've got, um, let me see, I'm just checking my box to see if I've got um, some of the, we've got, oh I can't, put, I wonder, Tulia, Tulan, um, who lives in a village in Pontignac, Borneo. Um, oh, the, I think it was in response to Charlotte and the way they carried the fish. Um, so we've, I think we might have lost Tulian as well. Um, we've got some responses about the amazing stories and we've got saltfish that cooked in chilies, um, sambal and we keep it in a jar. So we've got that to look forward to. And we can also share our recipes with people on the chat as people have asked for, so that's great. Um, where are we? Have we lost Raquel? No, I'm here. Sorry. I'll take okay, it. lovely. Good, good. Um, so I think we are near to the end of our discussion. Um, we've had a lovely afternoon of eating and I think people are also hungry now. Time to go home. We've met, I mean, everybody's <laughs> skipped their lunch, haven't they, to join us. So okay, they the, might want to try the recipes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So they probably tried the recipes. We really want to thank everyone. Guys, without, without your contributions, we would not be able to talk about all these yum, yum meals that we've been looking at. One of the things though I did want to, uh, when you showed, I was really appreciated you showing your um, recipes in bilingually and I wanted whether you could pronounce some of the words for us because Portuguese, oh, sure. uh, would, would, uh, you know, would you be able so, to do that? Uh, so let me try to give you the recipe in Portuguese. Yeah. So it's cebolas, which okay. is onion, onion. Yes. garlic, <laughs> Uh, garlic is alho, alho. Boa. Uh, batatas, uh. potatoes. Oh, so your daughter understands. Yeah, sorry. Uh, pimentos vermelhos, red pepper. Then we have sal, salt, azeite, Olive oil, vinho branco, which is white wine, água, 
water. And I think that's it. And pesh, pesh, salmao, which is salmon. Um, mackerel, I don't recall. What's mackerel in Portuguese? Akavala. Akavala, yes, kavala. Uh, we had uh, white fish. Come right here. Sorry. <laughs> Just a uh, bit. Sometimes I get used to say it in English. Then I forgot. What's a soya? Soya. That's the white fish. And then I think that's it. If you want to try other fish, like pescada, ah! you can ask the Portuguese shop because they usually have it. It's also very good if you do it only cooked with potatoes, olive oil and vegetables. It's very, very tasty and yummy well, as well. Ask Joel to come and help me translate my recipe. Oh. Joel, okay. It's done very well. <laughs> yeah. Can I just add back to the language? Because well, we've got a few Portuguese words in Jamaican that you wouldn't know about. So I was saying to Yolanda, we have a, a pudding, which is probably, um, we call it gizada. Quejada. There you go, quejada. And it's the same thing. Um, it's literally like your quejadas. If I'd had time, I could have made it, and then we could share that um, cultural icon because I love. Oh, them. absolutely! Yeah, and then we've got another dish, which I'm, I'm sorry that um, Omer's not here because we've got something called dukunu, which mm. is a Ghanaian um, dish, which in Jamaica some of us call it blue drawers, but if you go to another part of Ghana, it's called dukunu. So the way the languages have, have got all these um, similarities and differences have been brilliant, actually. But I really say, I, I've loved watching, seeing your recipes. I felt very hungry um, watching, looking at them. And thank you so much for your beautiful presentations. They've just been amazing. Thank you. Um, I just want to finish off by saying to people that the rec we have recorded the event and we'd also like you um, to fill in the evaluation forms because this is part of the Being Human programme. So we like to see how well we've done. And as well, we all want to know how well we've done and how, well, how much you've enjoyed the show. And I hope we have other opportunities to go into further discussions about our food and culture because that's what makes us human, isn't it? Just sharing our wonderful global experiences of food, culture, language, and identity. We're all different, we're all unique, and yet we're all global. So thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>